Welcome to Healthy Frontiers. My name is Dr. Bizzoni. I'm a chiropractor, and this show is dedicated to the education of our viewers. The topic for tonight is wide awake surgery. My special guest is Dr. David Way. Dr. Way is an accomplished hand and upper extremity specialist at orthopedic and neurosurgical specialists who, see, who sees a, a patients at the ONS office both in Greenwich and in a few weeks they'll be opening up right here in Westchester in Harrison, New York. Dr. Way is a fellowship trained specialist in hand, wrist, and elbow conditions and injuries. He's surgically skilled in microsurgical nerve reconstruction, arthroscopic treatment of wrist and elbow disorders, tendon reconstruction and repair, and endoscopic treatment of carpal tunnel syndrome. His expertise includes the diagnosis and treatment of arthritis of the hand, wrist, and elbow, fractures, sports injuries, trigger finger, tennis elbow, ganglion cysts, just among other things. He earned his medical degree at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and completed his residency training at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center. He then received fellowship training in hand and upper extremity surgery at Tufts University Medical Center. New England Baptist Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He has authored and published many scientific articles and has presented his work to various medical associations. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Wade to the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's our pleasure. Dr. Wade, we're going to start right in, okay? Sure. And let's talk about what the topic is, is wide awake surgery. Why don't you tell the audience about that? Wide awake hand surgery is probably one of the most significant changes in hand surgery over the past several years. And it's really changed the way I practice. Uh, wide awake hand surgery means the patient comes in for surgery. There's no tourniquet. It's only purely local anesthesia. Right. Okay. Um, so I've heard it said that wide awake surgery is one of the most significant advances uh, in hand of surgery. Why is this technique so important for surgeons? I, I think for, for patients and surgeons alike, it makes a really big difference, not just for the patient experience, but also helping with outcomes and also decreasing complications. Yeah. So I'll give you an example of a patient I just saw yesterday. Please. Um, 80 year old woman. She comes in, she has diabetes, she has clear signs of carpal tunnel syndrome. Mm -hmm. So numbness in the hand and also atrophy of some of the muscles around the thumb. And those are classic signs, indications for surgery. Right. So I talked to her about her options. She's already tried and failed non-surgical options and she wanted to have surgery. And mm -hmm. let's say this was 10 years ago, even right. just five years ago. Um, surgeons who are not trained in wide awake surgery when this was not as popular, she would have several different hoops to jump through before having surgery. So right. I'll just kind of go through that Please experience do. for you. Yeah. So the first thing she would do is being 80 years old, she would see her primary care doctor. She would have to have medical clearance. Mm -hmm. Having medical clearance means she, ha she really needs to have labs drawn. So it's another visit maybe to a phlebotomist. Right. She may need a, a, an EKG or a chest x-ray, mm -hmm. so a couple of other things to do. Right. Um, and all these things are time commitments for the patient. It's also an extra cost to the healthcare system, sure. to the patient. Um, those are all things that we can eliminate right. from this entire surgical experience from doing just local anesthesia. Right, great, okay. So h how does it benefit the patients then, overall? So uh, moving on to the next step, yeah. Um, after skipping all those preoperative and unnecessary medical clearances, mm -hmm. when they come in for surgery, a diabetic patient like her, she doesn't have to stop her diabetic medications. She doesn't have to stop eating. She can have food right before surgery. Um, right. And because they're awake throughout the process, throughout the surgery, they can drive home. Right. So there's no sedation. There's no need for it. Mm -hmm. And the main advancement of that is because there's no need for a tourniquet. Right. Without a tourniquet, when we do our hand surgeries, there's no pain. Mm -hmm. And once we remove the, the tourniquet pain, there's really no need for sedation for general anesthesia. Right. Probably a lot less pain afterwards as well, correct? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. So is wide awake surgery the new standard for hand and wrist surgery procedures? Or Yeah, it's a great, a great question. Yeah. I think that, um, I wouldn't say it's a new standard. I think for many of my surgeries, I do do them uh, wide awake because of the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. But I always give patients the option of sedation. Um, right. I don't think it's for everyone. Mm -hmm. Some patients, for example, may be too anxious. Mm -hmm. um, some patients might be too young uh, to be able to be awake for the surgery. So right. for certain patients, I don't do it. But for many, many patients, um, they enjoy it. So you really have to uh, scrutinize and find out who's a candidate right. first. That's exactly. one of the first things. Right. You know? yep. Okay. So um, what types of conditions benefit most from the use of wide awake in uh, surgery and wrist surgery? And why? 
Yeah, I think the most common things we do, like carpal tunnel syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, trigger finger, for, for example, um, right. even complicated surgeries like tendon lacerations. Yeah. So for carpal tunnel surgery, it's a very short, uh, very um, quick experience for the patient. Mm -hmm. So it really eliminates all those other things that make surgery a difficult time. Mm -hmm. So many times after surgery, if you're sedated, um, patients have to wake up in the recovery room. It adds time to their experience. Right. Um, another example is a trigger finger. Right. So trigger fingers are a problem with your tendons in your hand. Yeah. And all your tendons travel through these small rings or eyelets, mm -hmm. and that's what keeps your tendons in place. Right. When you have a trigger finger, uh, the tendon can become a little swollen, mm -hmm. and it gets caught in one of these eyelets. Right. So patients, when they come in, they complain about pain in their palm, sometimes in their finger, mm -hmm. and many times their fingers are stuck down. Yeah. So when they try to open them, there's a snap. Right. Right. So my job as a hand surgeon is to get rid of that snapping sensation and also the pain. Right. And the reason why this can really benefit, being awake for the patient actually mm -hmm. allows the patient to participate in their surgery. Mm -hmm. So even though they have no pain, no feeling, mm -hmm. once the anesthesia is working, they can actually check to see if my release is complete. So right. during surgery, That's right. they can actually open their hand and check to see if that triggering or that snapping sensation is gone. Yeah, and for, yourself, and for you as the doctor, Absolutely. I mean, it's got to be a help. You yeah, know? I, I mean, can I can leave the room with confidence that everything is done. Yeah. Why don't we just yeah. go back a step? What mm -hmm. is exactly a trigger finger? I know you went through it's a tendon tightening yeah. and swelling, but maybe just yeah. what's the causes of it? Maybe another great question. Uh, nobody knows why people get trigger fingers, and some people do, and some people don't. Okay. Um, we think that we know the pathology behind it is some swelling around the tendon, right. and because of that swelling, you have a hard time traveling through that constrictive ring or pulley is right. what we call them in the hand. Okay. People who are diabetic are more likely to get these type of problems, but nobody really knows why a normal patient without diabetes gets them. Yeah, and is it yeah. more common in any one finger? Because I also notice you, you do uh, trigger thumb. Right. So what? Yeah. <laughs> um, it is very common in the ring finger, in the middle finger, less common in the border digits, like the right. index or the small finger. Right. Thumbs are also very common, and thumb trigger fingers are sp a specific separate entity for kids, actually. Okay. Adults can have them, but kids also have something called a congenital trigger thumb. Got it. So even young babies can have trigger thumb. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. great. So, um, let's see. How do patients react when you first suggest operating, yeah. you know, on them while they're fully awake, yeah. you know? Um, it's been interesting seeing the reaction. I think that it's a relatively new type of technique. Mm -hmm. So it's been around in Canada earlier, but you know, relatively speaking, in, in the U.S., it's newer. Right. Um, so in my training as an early young resident, many people were not doing wide awake hand surgery. Mm -hmm. And as we began to introduce it into the population and amongst hand surgeons, mm -hmm. I think the reaction has really varied widely. Okay. Some hand surgeons, for example, um, who may not be as comfortable speaking to their patients during the surgery may not right. want to do it that way. Yep. And, and there are many good reasons for not doing it wide awake. But when I speak to my patients and I offer them wide awake, I think that the reactions are very positive. Right. It's very equivalent, let's say, going to a dentist. Right. So it's not a dental appointment, but you yeah, know, no, it, it, it is yeah. a very, um, it's a very discreet and very kind of shortened experience, meaning you don't have to do all this other preoperative and postoperative type right. of recovery. Which is great. I mean, yeah. we keep saying that, which is great. And also that you can see what's actually happening. Right. I think a, a patient will feel a lot more comfortable if they know that you know. Right. And right. In fact, some patients yeah. um, love seeing what is happening. So I will yeah. often have a drape or still a drape between my patient and I, but right. there are times when they want to participate and I'll have them lower it and they can take a look. Yeah, yeah, And uh, they're, they're often very comfortable doing it. Are that. they looking at a monitor or is it actually no, looking they at their can, hand? No, they actually are looking right over, let's say it's the right hand, they might be looking up and then they can look over across the drape and see what, what work we're doing. Perfect. Okay, so uh, how do they usually react during the surgery? You know? During the surgery, I think it's very important to make sure that the patient is comfortable. And right. I think that the biggest fear for patients are that they might be anxious, they really may not like the sound of me working. Um, right. We always make sure all of our patients are very comfortable from our nursing to our staff to everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. They know the patient's awake, they're very aware that the experience is the most important. Yeah. So we concentrate on small things like having their favorite type of music on. Right. We also make sure that as I'm speaking to them, they're comfortable. So I'm always constantly checking in with them yeah. throughout the procedure. Got it. And so. 
here's a question. I'm a patient. I'm mm -hmm. getting this done, and I think I could deal with this whole thing. And all of a sudden, I can't deal with it. Right. What happens? Yeah. What do you do? It's rare. That's rare, but it certainly okay. is a possibility we consider. Mm -hmm. So some patients, for example, we may offer them, if they are anxious, um, a prescription of an anti-anxiety pill, just so right. they have it on board. Mm -hmm. um, there's always the possibility that they might need something more. Right. If that's ever the case, we have anesthesia around, we have anesthesiologists around, um, but it does change their, their post-op protocol. So if we do give them a sedative or a mm -hmm. strong sedation, they would still have to wake up afterwards as if they had anesthesia. Right. So we usually just resort to an oral type of anti-anxiety pill. Got it. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm only asking that because say the patient, gee, that sounds good to me, right. but what if during it I start All right. getting a little freaky, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a, a lot of the MD general practitioners now getting aware of this gen awakened surgery so they can actually right. talk to the patient, hey, right. Dr. Way is doing this. And, right. I, I think know. many are, but not everyone. And I think that's a large part of the reason why, why talks like this are very helpful. Yeah, great. Okay. So can wide awake surgery be performed on patients of all ages? I know you alluded to, you know, younger ones. Right. Who, Right. Talk about that a bit. It, it's a very important point. So yeah. I think that especially in the elderly people who see me, right. over 65, mm -hmm. um, and I, I wouldn't count that as elderly, but this right. is by the Senior papers. Senior population. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, there have been papers studying specifically people over 65. They have a big benefit in having wide awake surgery because the, the complications are much lower. Right. So if you eliminate anesthesia, you have no, no risk from anesthesia at all, right. and that can really help with their overall outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the other end of the spectrum, um, right. at young patients, I think if they're a mature patient who can really tolerate being awake, yes. it's like going to the dentist. Right. And um, the youngest person I've operated on is about 12 years old. Oh. And she had a cyst that came out. She did excellent. Yep. We gave her, um, I'll tell you a little bit about yeah, her please, experience. Tell me story, yeah. um, and she just had a small cyst in her hand. And right. it's something that if it bothers the patient enough, we often will take out these lumps and bumps. Right. Um, she was a mature 12 year old. Right. And uh, you can get a sense of the patient in the, op in the office prior to surgery. Mm -hmm. And because she didn't want to have to miss too much school, she really wanted to be awake and she was aware of all these things. Mm -hmm. For her, it was a very easy trip. It was about an hour and a half of, sur of being in the surgery center to leaving. Um, wow. The surgery itself was only about 10 or 15 minutes. Right. We numb it up in the preoperative area. Right. The patient feels almost nothing. Sometimes they might feel a small prick, mm -hmm. but that's it. Done. And, and they leave. Well, that's great. So if a 12-year-old can tolerate it, I mean, that's yeah. pretty good. Uh, right. Good. So uh, does the procedure require hospitalization ever? or? Hardly. So unless the patient's there for some other reason, in right. the hospital for maybe another another fracture or some other medical problem. Mm -hmm. um, almost all patients who are wide awake, they, they have ambulatory surgery, so they come and go. And right. in fact, that's a great point because yeah. many patients love it mm -hmm. uh, because they can drive home. Yep. They don't need anyone there to help them drive home. They can right. drive home themselves. Perfect, so um, is the recovery time any different than traditional surgery? I would say no. it's similar. So. I, I think the recovery time in the short term is very different though. So when they're in the post-op uh, waiting room or the post-op recovery room, right. they spend a much shorter amount of time there. Right. Um, when, you're, when you're waking up from sedation, it can take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're recovering from being wide awake, there's no recovery. They right. can leave within five minutes, 10 right. minutes. Ready to go. Yeah. Great. Ready to go. Doc, why don't we talk a little bit about some of the other conditions, maybe of the elbow. We asked you, you know, sure. we were talking about wrist and uh, hand, but why do work surgery for an elbow, maybe for conditions like Tommy John, which is something that I'd like right. you to explain to the audience so they understand what a Tommy John surgery is. Of course, is. right. Please. So um, first off, wide awake surgery for the elbow is very rare, if not impossible. And the reason behind that is epinephrine is the key for allowing hemostasis or control of bleeding for our surgeries. When you talk about the elbow, it's very hard to control that with the amount of volume that's necessary. Mm -hmm. So it's unlikely we would do a wide awake surgery for the elbow. Right. But getting back to your question, Tommy John surgery yes. is a surgery for the elbow. Right. And it's for patients who might be pitchers or any kind of ball handling or throwing athletes. Mm -hmm. And the ligaments in the elbow, for right. example, the ones on the medial side and the lateral side mm -hmm. are the ones that stabilize it. Right. And a pitcher or a thrower when they're cocking back for throwing, mm -hmm. you can stress or sometimes rupture the medial side of the elbow. Right. And Tommy John surgery is taking a reconstruction using your tendons mm -hmm. to make that ligament. 
Right. And the healing process for that is, is, is a little more lengthy. It can right? absolutely. It, it can be, be. It can be a long recovery. Right. Um, and and the goal though is to really stabilize the elbow. I'm going to ask you a question about young youngsters pitching sure. in high school and right. you know younger grades and you know throwing hard and you know trying to imitate right. their idols. Yeah. What do you think about that? I mean, do you think that's uh, making them a little more prone to this? Uh, yeah, you know, it's a tough injury. question. I, I know it is. I, I think that. Just um, your thoughts. So the literature supports that the those patients or those kids who mm -hmm. are throwing year round are at much higher risk. Right. And that we know for sure. That's right. hard evidence. So I often will counsel patients to don't uh, don't throw throughout the year. Don't right. pitch throughout the year. Change your sport up. Do something else. Um, the other uh, the other thing that's not quite as clear are special types of throws. If curve balls or special types of throws are the ones that might put more stress on those medial ligaments, that's still a little bit controversial. But absolutely, I think that um, in the young athlete, they can be more prone to having an injury like a medial collateral ligament injury mm -hmm. if they're throwing year-round. Got it. That's great. Okay, so multiple sports for these kids if they can do it. And right. We really recommend that highly. Right. Great. Okay. How about something like a ganglion cyst? Yeah. You hear the word ganglion cyst. Right. I know when I was growing up, people would just take a book and try That's and bang right. it. You know? Yeah. So why don't you talk about that a little bit? So it's probably one of the most common themes I see in the office. Ganglion cysts are benign collection of fluid. Okay. So the the fluid originates from inside the wrist joint, mm -hmm. and the first and the number one place that people often get ganglion cysts are right on the back of the wrist, right. and sometimes they can be small. Mm -hmm. If they're small, sometimes you can't see them. And patients will come in with uh, a kind of vague sense of pain, especially with certain things that require extremes of wrist extension. So mm -hmm. push-ups, planks, yoga, sometimes sure. swimming, gymnastics, all those things can have generalized wrist pain. Right. And oftentimes, the only way to diagnose that is with an MRI. Right. But let's say you have a, a large one. Right. A large one that you can see, oftentimes right. what that means is there's a small hole in the sac that surrounds the wrist. So all of our joints, the elbow, the knees, the hips, they all have a sac or a capsule mm -hmm. that contains the joint fluid. Right. If there's a certain small part of that capsule that has a hole, the fluid leaks out and it forms kind of a balloon or a cyst. And Got that's it. what it's from. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. And the surgically to repair that is you repair the that sac of, that surrounds the joint? Yeah. So um, I, tr I think that the first thing we do is to try to treat it without surgery. Right. So what that might mean for a patient is draining it and mm -hmm. seeing if that works. Right. If these drainages don't work and it keeps coming back, then surgery is an option. Right. Um, surgical options can, can vary. Sometimes, mm -hmm. and many times, I will treat these arthroscopically. Mm -hmm. um, arthroscopy, as you probably know, is small incision, incision right. surgery so that we make small incisions on the back of the wrist. Mm -hmm. And my job as the surgeon is to actually remove the sac around the cyst. Got it. Okay, great. Let's talk just a little bit more about uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Oh, and, sure. You know, maybe some of the causes of it and what right. it is actually. A lot of people right. hear the term. Yeah. Right. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a constellation of symptoms. Okay. And those symptoms are primarily numbness and tingling in your hand. Mm -hmm. And usually it's the first three fingers, so your thumb, your index finger, and your middle finger. Right. You'll have numbness or tingling or pins and needle type feelings. Yeah. Many patients who have had it for a while, they can have it so severely that they're awoken at night from it. Right. Okay. And the main cause is yeah. compression of the nerve, mm -hmm. the median nerve. Right. And the nerve travels underneath a, a ligament that forms like a band right. across your wrist. Mm -hmm. And if um, you're doing repetitive activities, right. um, if you have a lot of vibratory or kind of hard impact on the hands, mm -hmm. um, even sometimes bad posture or not great ergonomics can yep. put a lot of pressure on your wrist and your hand, mm -hmm. and it can lead to carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah. And that will irritate that median nerve, as you mentioned, that's right. right? And that's yep. what gives you the pain, and that's right. the patients will get this numbness, tingling sensation. Absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, I, right. I've actually seen a lot more of that in my life now, yeah. my professional life, right. because of computers and Absolutely. You know, all that that's right. uh, upon us now. Right. We're starting young kids, right? Right. Um, young kids so. can have it. It's more common in older people, but right. I think that young kids mm -hmm. um, and more recent studies have actually shown that other factors like diabetes, right. um, a high BMI, can mm -hmm. contribute to these type of problems. Okay. So before we end here, mm -hmm. why don't we just take me to a visit to your office. Sure. I walk in the front door. Right. Okay. I have having some hand pain. Right. 
what, what, what goes on? Tell us. So I think um, it's a great question. Yeah. Uh, at our group, I think our primary goal is to make sure that the entire experience from the minute you pick up the phone to the moment you leave the door, that you have a seamless experience. Mm -hmm. um, our goal is to make sure that you not only have the top specialty um, type doctors, but also you have a very experienced group of physicians who work together. Right. So when you walk in the door, um, our staff greets you, yep. um, and we, we make sure that we really minimize the amount of wait time you have. Right. Um, I see you in the office. I spend a lot of time talking to you specifically about your diagnosis, mm -hmm. making sure that we have a conversation just like this so that yes. you understand what we're doing. And we always try to treat our patients first without surgery before we consider surgery. Right, and if need be, I'm sure you contact the, the primary physician and you guys absolutely. work in, in harmony yeah. with that. Right. I've actually been to your facility, yeah. which is absolutely fabulous, beautiful. Right. Um, and uh, I know first class uh, operation for sure. Yeah, we love communicating yeah. with our, our entire medical team and also making sure we're available for our patients yeah. as well. Yeah, that's great. So, Doc, I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Pleasure's mine. And uh, look forward to uh, maybe another conversation. All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you.